YouTube! It's time to let go and it's time to move on, like all men must do with their 10-year-old pet deck. But today is not that day! We're taking Burning Abyss for one last ride through the tunnel in this long-style form of vlog content. I'll be heading to locals multiple times a week to improve my gameplay, see what my decks can do, and commentate, analyze my duels, which will hopefully be something you can extrapolate some knowledge from just by watching. I'll be taking different decks, building upon my current lists, and taking all kinds of suggestions from you, the viewer. Patreon is much appreciated. For those of you who'd like to see more of this type of content, it isn't cheap to play Yu-Gi-Oh! IRL, and of course the production with the editing etc etc would go a long way and of course you get your name shown up in the video like this let me know what you would like from this series, what decks you want me to play, and any general feedback down below. This week, we're headed over to Paisley near Glasgow in Scotland. For those of you in and around this area, please do come on down to Comic Crazy. It's a great little local scene, and sometimes we even hit almost 40 players just for a standard Wednesday night tournament. Let's see what we can cook up today. Well, let's head over to round one, game number one. And well, do we have a matchup here? A, I want to say somewhat favorable matchup as a combo deck. Trap decks do tend to do quite nicely into combo when you pair some of those powerful trap cards together to out full fields. Let's see how this one plays out. Our hand is not awful, we did draw the one-off tour guide, and as I mentioned in my deck profile, she's not really an early game card, and it's mostly something you want to see after you've ground your opponent out with your back row. We do have access to Torrential Tribute with this hand, but it's going to be a little rough with the restriction on Trap Trick, and it could be worth some analysis in the deck building portion. Our opponent is going to start off with Neo Space Connector, and um, should we just go to game two? Aqua Dolphin has a little peeper sleeper at my hand, and honestly, if he's smart enough, he should really have this one in the bag here to play around all of my trap cards. There's time in these kind of matchups, you're never really going to get into too much of a grind, so I'm not concerned much with the round timer, and so I'm just going to play it out to the end in hopes of maybe potentially a critical misplay. After our opponent has a little bit of fun, he ends on a Baron de Flor negate, a Gear Freed negate, a Spell and Trap negate with the Link 1 Charlemagne, who also maintains the Charles effects, by the way, and the ability to tag into Roland and pop a card. Not sure if some purpley boys can handle that. Let's have a look. We pick Graph off of the top here, and honestly, a power trap would have been ideal here to combo with the Solemn Strike, but that does mean it gives us two BAs and Tour Guide. So we're gonna try and lead with a Machine X play and try for Zeus. At the end of main phase one, however, he equips on with the Roland to Charles and tries to pop my Machine X. We exchange a couple of suck attempts into negates, but it's not going to be enough to force much out here other than the Gear Freed. In hindsight, there was maybe a potential opportunity to go for the Fortune Tune, as it does have targeting and destruction protection, but inevitably it would end in the same way since Zeus would only be able to be three materials and the downward we rank up into would inevitably, probably, be popped on summon, therefore not having enough materials to detach to go for a multi-activation Zeus. Tour Guide is our last hope here, which is of course met with a Baron Negate, so everything has been forced out and we just have to simply pray that three trap cards get us there. In the standby phase, he tries to Baron tag out and I use my trap trick building up into a torrential play, hoping that he does something to this so that our strike can get some kind of value since the trap trick locking us into only one more trap is going to be a bit of a kicker here. He doesn't take the bait, we set Torrential, flip it on, of course, the Charles deals with that nicely and easily to my horror. Not too bad of a game one, honestly. As I mentioned, trap cards when correctly paired together can honestly just take down an entire field of a combo deck, but that trap trick restriction is really the big issue here and maybe something to think about removing in the future, especially when you're playing such a heavy build of trap cards, almost 22 I think I'm running. Over to game number Number two, we get to go first this time, and that's always fun with some uh, trap cards. Our hand is definitely above average, but unfortunately we do miss out on the Mascarena by not opening any one of our Rhinos or Graphs, so Beatrice set to pass will just have to be enough. He begins spamming the field with an entourage of Infernoble Monsters, and I'm personally not too worried here. I do have two Solemn cards that obviously play really nicely into extra deck summons, and obviously Beatrice to disrupt the Isolde with a Farfa send potentially, but I'm trying really hard to hold on to her so that I can try find me some follow-up by relying on Skarm. I see a chance to go for a Beatrice here. I'm not sure exactly what my goal was looking back at this in hindsight. It could have been to Farfa the Tuner, but it doesn't really matter. He has Ash Blossom regardless. I considered striking it, but that feels like a horrible trade. With three warriors already on the field, we net ourselves a Seer back to our hand and let that resolve. He's forced to go into the extra deck eventually, as I'm remaining really patient and trying not to to be too trigger happy with the Solemns. Angelica has just far too much text. I'm not really interested in finding out what that says. We're gonna throw down a Solemn Strike. His field spell helps him pick up an equip, go for some searching and extensions into Roland, and is met with an old man saying no. Back to our turn here, we didn't get that tour guide follow-up, so a simple seer summon 
sends himself to the woods to bring back Dante, lining up for a Zeus and a back row as follow-up into a singular set card. His field gets him into an equip into a Renaud, Ogier dumps a Gearfried, which is very concerning because of the Renaud, but Ice Dragon Prison is a perfect combination of Grave and Field Removal to stop that play right in its tracks. He keeps pushing and oh my god bro, let it go, let me have this, please. I have to Zeus here as there's two warriors and I'm terrified because his last card was an infinite impermanence to negate the Zeus play. He clears, go for Zeus, realizes that's actually a legal play because of the field spell, locking you to warriors, and then proceeds to concede the duel. That was a big back and forth and eventually we did pull through that just by the skin of our teeth. Let's see how game number three goes. Game number three next, and again, it really is drawing that perfect combination of trap cards that can help force out negates into a blowout needle ceiling or torrential. And oh boy, do we see it. Divine Wrath, Torrential Tribute could potentially close out this one for us just by themselves. He lines us up for an Aqua Dolphin Snipe here, knocking Seer out of the hand because he controls Gearfried. Fortunately, it's the worst one with no grave set up, and he continues through a flurry of some plays. He goes for an Azoldi Send 4, which I don't know in for nobles, but that definitely seems odd if you're not summoning Armageddon Knight and drawing Exodia. He recognizes he's done something wrong with his combo here and only ends on a Gear Freed, so yes, <laughs> there's a chance for us. With only one negate to protect himself, the DD package into a double Zeus play is more than enough to clear the field. We set two cards, pick up a tour guide, and end our turn. As soon as he hits two bodies, we're flipping Torrential Tribute. He pushes forward with Ogier, and with only one card left in his hand and a normal summon used, I figured, why not drop the Divine Wrath and dig for another disruption with the Backjack discarding itself. On our turn, we go for a tour guide play. We can't OTK since we control a spell and trap card. But that's okay, this game is all but over with the amount of advantage we've accrued at this stage. It sets us up really nicely here for the Mask Beatrice. While he does draw Harpy's Feather Duster on his turn, there's nothing left that Beatrice and Mask can't have handle against a singular card, resulting on the clapback for a simple Farfa send attack for game. Sometimes it isn't about luck or even playing that well. Sometimes it really is just hope for your opponent to forget their combo. So fortunately for us, we head on over to round number two, one and oh. Well, we lose the dice roll again, but that's okay. Our deck doesn't really care too much about the dice roll. And would you look at that? Joel Branded is here. He has instant fusion for Predaplant plays into Branded stuff, ending on Mirror Jade, Dragoon, and two set cards. We draw for our turn, and our hand is six Burning Abyss monsters. Yeah, that's kind of not really the ratio I was looking for in a trap deck. We summon out Farfa, and clearly, as someone who is not familiar with Burning Abyss cards, it seems to think that Farfa can just force out the Dragoon here. Or something? I don't know. Burning Abyss monsters are once per turn, so we very acceptingly take that Mirror Jade Banish. We summon two more monsters and get hit with Super Polymerization. Really makes you wonder why Burning Abyss monsters aren't fire, but anyway. We're now staring down Starving Venom, but hey, on the plus side, that's no cards in hand for Dragoon. We go for another Zeus line, and at this point you're probably wondering, Farfa, this isn't Burning Abyss, you're just playing Gosek and Pure Zoo, but you have to exceed summon using two monsters instead of one. What's that about? To that criticism, I will say, mind your own business. Now, the reason I don't go for the DD package here and instead opt for Dante Downard is because I know he has no more disruptions left and I haven't used Seer, meaning that Zeus will clear and I will also get to end on a Beatrice. And the reason why I changed Zeus effect again and didn't just keep the two materials because I didn't detach my Dante Seer since I would like to play around Call by the Grave here and also I'm losing my monster anyway at the end of this turn because of Mirror Jade. In the end phase, Beatrice dies, but of course this allows me to float up into a Pilgrim Dante. He draws for turn, has one dead card in hand, it appears, passes back to me, and we take this down fairly easily with a bunch of spamming up into Cherubini for access code talker. Game number two here, he's gonna start again, and while I don't really play many hand traps, the one I do have are perfect for specifically this matchup, as we draw Druid's Worm and Infinite Impermanence. He summons out the Lube Lion with Branded Fusion, discarding Ad Libitum for cost, and that's gonna go really nicely into the Infinite Impermanence. No more plays left, he simply sets to and passes turn. For a moment, I consider summoning Druid's Worm immediately on the Albaz, but I figured we might as well hold for our turn, just in case. We set into four cards, quite confident that our remaining traps should be able to stun any follow-up, which he has, by going Alibur off of a branded opening in the standby phase. I'll meet that with a solemn strike, and he has nothing left but to go into the battle phase and give me a Skarm in the graveyard. Ah, the advantages of playing a 10-year-old deck that nobody knows nothing about. He passes, we get Tour Guide, which is going to be met with a dimensional barrier for, well, annoyingly, we would have really liked to go with a Beatrice, but that's okay. 
Burning Abyss has it all, baby. We've got Link plays as well. There's still a set card here, and it wasn't flipped immediately on our normal summon tour guide, so I'm smelling blood in the water. I take a moment to think this turn out, and I can't quite figure out if I can lethal under D-Barrier, so I decide to just beef up my Seer, do a little bit of damage to set up for next turn, and end on a Trubini with a bunch of floaters. He doesn't see a top deck branded fusion for the third turn, and fortunately for us, we're just free to try again and lethal him, but look at that, dimensional barrier number two. Shouldn't be a problem, we just summon out Druze Worm, go for game with an access code talker. Is Burning Abyss a real deck? No. Admittedly, we were fortunate he doesn't seem to know how our deck works, and that Mirror Jade effect really cost him the game, but all that means is that we proceed to round number three on a 2-0 record. Let's see if we can keep a clean sheet here. So we finally won a dice roll. This is looking really nice and promising at locals today as we need that type of luck as we go deeper and deeper into the tournament. Our opening hand is the dream actually with removal and a negate as well as the standard mask Beatrice combo. We're gonna lose out on a Skarm search unfortunately as we need to make sure we keep Seer's grave effect live and can't afford to use it on the hand effect. Our opponent's gonna start with a pot of extravagance, a very solid opening play. He leads with a Kaiju into a Mascarena instead of on Beatrice. Curious, that brings out a Interrupted Slumber. I suppose the logic was that if we get to keep Masquerade, I get an indestructible monster, but joke's on you. I want you to destroy Beatrice. Our grave effects resolve. Pilgrim hits the field and we net a Seer back to our hand. The start of the battle phase, we use Dante to draw a card, triggering the Seer for Dante, and he runs over our Pilgrim, which lets us use the rip of a random card from his hand effect, and we hit a... Makanko. Main phase two, he brings out the Huli, sets two, and I decide to just throw out Needle Ceiling because it was probably the only time this would ever get value, and I figured I would might as well drop it here. Still in the end phase, I'm gonna shuffle back with a Trap Trick into a Griefing play, sending Skarm, who gets me Tour Guide from the Underworld. We finally get to my turn here, I drop the Tour Guide. That's okay into two back row somehow, and Rather than going for a Zeus line, I know he has Slumber in the graveyard, meaning that it would really be for nothing. I figured the best thing to do would be to try and take some cards away with a Unicorn Spin and maintaining my set trap. I'm really terrified at this point since I don't have too much disruption into a potential second Extravagance or Slumber, but on his turn he ponders for a moment and picks up for game number two. Well, in game number two, I suppose I use a little bit of that old gray hair experience and recognize that this heavy kaiju engine seems to be some form of a go second strategy. I side for going first and lo and behold, he actually did make me start. I go for Dante set two cards and fine, make your stupid jokes now. Haha, <laughs> is it 2014 again? Spare me your judgment. At least this is a better end board than Anger Knuckle Pass and Earth Machine. He goes prep for the Makanko Ritual, which is basically just Rhoda for the deck, activating her effect, and god I wish my judgment that I set here was a strike instead. That's gonna get him into the equip spell, which is like Bounce and an e telly I believe, which is really good into my deck that wants to hit the graveyard. He summons out Hyun Lee from a Fire Dance, and maybe I should have used my Solemn Judgment here, but unfortunately I'm not at all familiar with the Makankos that aren't the Ritual Monster, and I feel like I'm in a bit of a nightmare situation here here for my build. His monsters are immune to battle, destruction, and targeting. And what's really left? Well, basically just Zeus is my only out here, and that's assuming I don't kill myself running into these cards. He tries to spend my Dante, and I guess I'm forced to judgment here, following up with another Slumber, which completely ignores his Makanko's protection. Back to my turn here, I'm gonna summon out Tour Guide, go for a Fortune Tune, and try and deal minimal damage into Huli, reflecting 400 into myself. Zeus the board, and instead of making a 4 material Zeus, I decide to save the downer because of the Kaiju search that he has in the graveyard. In the standby phase, I go Trap Trick, and I forgot what I was looking for here in hindsight, it might have been something that I sided out, um, but I think I was trying to stop a Makanko in some way, uh, but then realized very quickly that I, I go for Ice Dragon Prison, uh, and they all have different typings, so it didn't really matter. He simply equips his guy, and then rams into my defense positions just for game, that solemn judgment costing me a lot of life into game three. At this point, I am genuinely lost. His deck does seem like a direct counter to mine. I don't think I have much way in my side deck to really deal with a deck that is immune to targeting, battle, and destruction. I guess our only hope here is to let him start and then try an OTK, praying that he's got some sort of bricked kaiju hand. So we've got a weird hand, no monsters as of yet, and Dark Ruler really was the only thing I could think of to turn off the annoying uh, protection effects of Huli here, so it's really all I could basically side deck. 
Uh, he's gonna go first, which I mentioned I would let him do that. Ends on the Huli lock as well as a trap and then passes over to us. Well, me big, me strong. I set five cards and end my turn. He goes for the red Makanko, which I feel forced to stop here, even though annoyingly my Solemn Strike won't actually remove the monster because of the Huli. I seize my opportunity eventually on the next turn, but decide to fire off that Dark Ruler no more to clear the Huli. In hindsight, however, I probably should be understanding as a player that, that that wasn't a good play ultimately because his deck needs me to have monsters. At this stage, I should have kept setting and passing, allowing myself an opportunity to try an OTK or at least doing enough damage in time. I feel very out of answers as my back row feels so dead and incapable of doing anything to these Makanko protection abilities. I try go for a Hail Mary play on this Ice Dragon, but again, the different typings on these monsters leave me with no defenses into a Kaiju tribute for game. In the end, a really bad matchup for myself, but poor gameplay and an inability to recognize my win condition early and fast enough results in a very deserved loss someone with my experience could have potentially avoided. Let's lick our wounds and head on over to the final round of today. We've lost the dice roll and that makes us one for three today. Very cool. Two BAs and three trap cards. Honestly, that's absolutely fine for going second. Let's see what we're up against. He's playing 50 cards and leads with Rite of Aramacer. Haven't seen this engine kick around in a while, but it's only making a comeback potentially. They normal summon Petal and uh, things happen, resulting in a set sheet, an active Con Con, and a gate, and a spooky mystery card. Con Con tribute for cost would be far too devastating, and so it's better for us to try and live with a monster set and keep our discard father in the hand here. They lead with the Draco back on our set monster, kind of surprising instead of hitting the back row here. His field goes into attack mode and proceeds to the battle phase. During the start step, we flip up Fiend Griefing, basically trying to fish for a disruption of sorts on the Griffin to try and remove it from the play with my Dino Mishes that I've got here. Backjack is going to get a response for us and it is a Phoenix Wing Wind Blast and no, I, I promise you it's not goat format. We go with the Wind Blast on the Sylvan Link, and he is just refusing to bite here on that Griffin, so we take the rest of the damage and let him go to main phase two, and oh boy, Thrust is now alive. However, you actually need to set with Thrust if your opponent has no monsters, and since technically he has five occupied zones with the activation of Thrust, he won't be able to set. During the end phase, we flip up Trap Trick, he chains with Griffin, and we chain with Dino Micious, targeting the token. We resolve the chain, and I've actually made a major misplay play here. I thought by removing the token from the field, the griffin would resolve without effect as it requires a token. But the token requirement is only part of the activation requirement, not the resolution. Well, we're just going to have to take that one on the chin. On our turn here, we're going for a Zeus play, but simply Con Con Tribute Steel leaves us with two cards in hand, but it is one of those stacked cards from Backjack. We normal summon Tour Guide from the Underworld. What a shame that Forbidden Droplets stops us lining up that all-important Zeus play that might have won us the game. He top decks Pankratops, and that's just going to be enough for me to scoop it up. It was a pretty bad misplay. Hard to say how much it really would have mattered inevitably. He just had so much more follow-up than us regardless. It can't be too upset about losing game one on the dice roll versus plants. Well, we're going to go first in game number two. We don't have that ideal Mascarena play. And our Dante Mills miss out on a potential Skarm search. Just going to have to be Beatrice Pass on this one. In some cultures, that is an FTK. Unexpected die is a great start in 50. There's a world where I was meant to use Beatrice on the Lokai here with the Farfa, but not comfortable with making Thrust live so soon. I decide to let it slide because there's definitely more clutch points coming up, especially with our set cards. He adds Sewing to the hand here and proceeds with a Lilliborea. We're promptly returning to the top of the deck with a Wind Blast, since we really don't want to deal with a potential Omni Negate of Regulus. It was inevitable, but there comes that Thrust, and it will be adding a copy of Triple Talents. He forces out our Beatrice with the Steel effect, and we don't have a choice but to chain here. Uh, chaining our Backjack as well in the graveyard, that set us up with a Dino Miscus. 50 card deck, right of Aramacer, two games in a row. I madge. That's okay, he's actually drawn the seed here, which has no effect because of the Aramacer, and this feels like an adequate place to wipe the three monsters up with a Torrential Tribute as well, using the Dynamicious to banish the Journey Search of the Draco back, removing any potential discard father for at least any Illegal Knight or Griffin plays he has thereafter. He's got two cards left in hand, passes it over to us with just a Dante on the field and one card in hand. Hmm, what could it be? Normal summon tour guide from the underworld. I try to work out game here, but we don't have any other access to any other names and we don't play Boral Sword, so it's impossible to lethal. We're just gonna set up a Machine X plus Zeus 
and hand it back over to plants. He adds with Rite of Aramacer, sowings out the loci, which he is trying to use as tribute fodder for the Rika Glamour to search out that Primula, and on the new chain, she will simply be sucked by our machine x we're going to game number three game number three and we have four trap cards one of which is torrential tribute and a rhino for follow-up i'm feeling pretty confident right now despite going second 50 cards right of aramacer again okay i mean i guess it's not master duel it is technically at six copies but hey Ubro drew the seed again let's go he passes over to us with a griffin negate and a set back row we're simply going to set five like it's 2005 and pass it back this time he chooses not to draco back a monster and instead bounces a random back Crow, which we will be chaining by discarding the rhino to target his token he's gonna griffin the gate which is absolutely perfect for us and it will be smacked with a solemn strike rhino dump skarm which will attempt to net as a tour guide and with two more sets we're pretty comfortably in the driving seat right now until he hits us with a thrust again talents is activated to draw two more cards here and picks up sewing for loci okay still trying to extend here gain some life and triggers the link one but his link to attempt of dance beyond will just be hit with a solemn strike while i feel very in control of the duel right now this has brought our life points down to 5,000, and with time fast approaching this one could go down straight to the wire. He has Princess to do some more extending here and even has the normal summon for Loki. Okay, that sucks. So our final gambit is to Torrential Tribute and pray that it's enough. And thankfully, it is to end the turn. We search our tour guide from the Underworld and know that this one should easily be in the bag with a little bit of damage and a Beatrice Mask play. But Droplets on our tour guide again leaves us so painfully behind now. We set one card and pass it up, I guess. So Wayne grabs Lokai here into Jasmine. He tries to go for an attack over Tour Guide, but we've got Ice Dragon's Prison, the perfect card in this matchup since all of his monsters are plants. We delete Princess and Jasmine from the game. He's forced to pass it up back again. There's a world where maybe letting Tour Guide die so we can summon BAs was correct, but with time looming, I just have to press for enough damage and hope that a trap off the top is enough to stop him in his tracks. He draws for turn and oh boy, that's a... Top deck Lilliborea into Regulus. Yikes. Regulus punches Torguide and passes turn. We draw Burning Abyss and that means we've got two level threes now. This allows us to go into the rank three for the DD monster, which we can activate to protect from battle to survive. Regulus cannot negate during the damage step because he only negates effects, not activations. So we have sacrificed 3000 for Solemn Strike and the damage from the DD attacking into Regulus. Pretty far behind on life. We climb up into Zeus. And then time is called. I think even for going second, I was pretty confident in this game. And maybe if it went on long enough, perhaps I could have won overall. I did feel like I was in a good spot, but it just is what it is with regards to time. We didn't have enough for me to get on top of the life points here. A decent performance from Burning Abyss all around against some pretty competitive decks. Let's take our prize support and uh, crack open some packs. Well, after a promising 2-0 start, it seems that the deck printed in 2014 just wasn't quite competent enough to be able to take a Away the whole thing. Let's check out the spoils of war and see what we've managed to pull this week. All right, so I don't know what the deal is with regards to price support these days at locals, but apparently you get this uh, promo card here, and I managed to nab myself a blazing Hita. Uh, I don't know which charmer is your favorite, but I would say uh, Area is kind of the uh, the optimal choice for gentlemen. All right, we only managed to nab two packs here. That is very unfortunate. Uh, well, what can you uh, really ask for with a 2-2 record? Uh, so, uh, I guess we'll start off with the Duelist Nexus here. Maybe, maybe this OTS will have a nice little ultimate rare to be able to make us feel a little bit better. Uh, Doomstar Ulka, Realm Resonance, uh, the Cuckoo Commanded to Croon. Beautiful name. Uh, Rescue Ace Preventer. Hopefully this one will prevent me from showing up with Burning Abyss next week again. Uh, and our Hollow appears to be the Ultimate Bright Knight Ursatron Alpha. Yes, Ursa Arctics with a couple of new support cards. Um, not something I'll be playing here. Uh, the new Testina Archetype. Aqua Chorus Round, a Storage Pod, and a Continuing Epic of Charles. Very cool. All right, here comes the all-important OTS pack. Will I get a ultimate rare to uh, make me feel significantly better than what occurred today? All right, here we go. Are you ready for this? We've got a nice little reprint here of the Synchro for anyone still playing Karakuri. I mean, gotta love those uh, early 2010s archetypes, am I right? Desynchro, Najasho, I heckin love evil tiles. Wow, if only uh, the, this pack contained a uh, ultimate rare Westlaw. And finally, ah, we got a super rare Nimble Angler. Well, if anyone here wants to play sprites and do some trades, then uh, here you go. Would you believe that this is the fourth and final time we're recording this? Surely, I truly am the master of technology and Burning Abyss. 
All right, first off, we're playing one copy of Tour Guide from the Underworld. It's uh, not great into hand traps, and there's no way to extend after it other than setting cards. Uh, never really came up with the second and third. The only bad situation is if it gets milled randomly off of Dante, but that won't happen. It's fine. Uh, shout out to my friend Strobot for giving me this list. It's a backjack sort of uh, discard centric version. So I would probably play three of this uh, and play even more discards, which is why it pairs really nicely with the uh, three Fiendish Rhino Warriors. Uh, Fiendish Rhino Warrior is a great normal summon because it gets you as it's basically an extra copy of Graph, and Graph lets you go into the Mascarena Beatrice, not just the Gravity Controller. And as well, it sends Disruption or Advantage like Skarm and the Backjack. Uh, so Fiendish Rhino Warrior is great in this deck. And of course, we're playing the uh, OGs here three Graph, three. Uh, Skarm, but only two Seer, mostly just because it's like really bad to see in your opening hand, except if, it's, especially if you're going for um, Gravity Controller. Other than that, it's a really bad discard outlet and it doesn't do anything just by itself in the graveyard because it needs setup. So just two here. Uh, two of me, Farfa. God, what is it like seeing yourself in a real card? I don't even know, man. Uh, okay, uh, here's the other four here, all the one-off names. Libich is, of course, very important because it lets you push on turn three. Uh, Calcab is just here to make up the names. It's not very good and there's not a lot of back with this format, I know. Uh, one single copy of Divine Wrath. This is something I'd probably play more copies of because it synergizes really well while having multiple backjacks. And a Rhino Warriors is just because it's a spell speed three. Sometimes you might miss on uh, your backjack with it, uh, but still very good card. Uh, Needle Ceiling is also really incredible as well because it works as a Torrential Tribute that you can activate at any time. Uh, and it's really good specifically because if you're playing multiple of the Divine Rafts or the Solemn Strikes or maybe Draco Utopian Aura, something you can also consider, uh, it, it basically clears any combo field in the game. So why only two? Well, I just... You know, uh, sometimes. Two copies of Trap Trick. Uh, you're going to see a lot of two-offs now, but basically the Trap Trick lets you to uh, gets you access to everything inside of your deck. However, I'm probably going to have a feeling that there's going to be so many times where it's like, hmm, how do I use all of these four other back row, but if I'm only locked into one? So there's definitely some anti-synergy here. Might be worth cutting in the future, but it synergizes really well with things like D-Barrier in the side deck. Two copies of Dynamicious, two copies of Ice Dragon Prison, and finally three copies of Fiendish Rhino, uh, Fiendish Griefing to send Rhino for backjack or get advantage with Skarm, as well as uh, disrupt your opponent's graveyard, which is very good against certain matchups. Uh, three uh, Solemn Strike, of course, I'd play like six of this if I could. Maybe you should actually, Draco Utopian Yor does the same thing. Uh, three Torrential Tribute, still somehow the best trap card in the game, but <laughs> no, it's not, just kidding. This card is Phoenix Wing Wind Blast, am I right? No. Farva, did you really put up Phoenix Wing Windblast in your deck in 2023? Uh, why don't you mind your own business? Could you believe that there are people who are still putting Sky Striker cards in their decks in 2023? Uh, anyway, here's the first uh, Zeus package with Downward Magician. Uh, works really well with the Fortune Tune because it's untargetable, indestructible, protects itself from battle. Uh, we're playing uh, the big Dante and, of course, his uh, hot waifu GF Beatrice. Shoutouts to the guy at YCS London, I think it was, who gave me a nameless Dante. I mean, look at that. That's so cool. Uh, the second Zeus package is the DD engine, uh, which is a really uh, sort of nice way to climb up um, outside of just going into the uh, the fortune tune if there's something you need to specifically remove because of the uh, rank 3's effect. Uh, I think it just destroys something after damage cal, kind of protects itself, so it's really good. Gravity control is really important because it gets you Beatrice if you only have access to Seer, not Graph. And the rest are just generic good like monsters like Access Code, Nightmare Unicorn, Mascarena, and Luigi Chetta Beanie. You can play Boral Sword because there's niche scenarios where, well, Beatrice plus Boral Sword exactly is game, whereas Access Code plus Beatrice isn't. That's the only time it comes up. Uh, but other than that, nothing really uh, mattered to me personally. It was fine. Uh, side deck, we're playing one copy of Feather Duster for any back row decks. Start rule is a bit weird at a trap deck because it's like traps are sometimes like you would you just want to set five against the co full combo deck. Uh, so Dark Ruler into a deck sometimes, but you need to specifically draw two BAs, which I mean, can is basically every hand. So Dark Ruler plus two BAs sort of is an FTK against combo decks. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Solemn Judgment, of course, for going first. It could be really funny to play Waking the Dragon. One day I'll be brave enough to do that. Three Infinite Impermanence, and we're playing three Bestials, just two Magnemut and a Druid's Worm. Just a little bit of hand trap synergy is like, okay. I don't think they're going to clash with the BAs that much because it is a trap version mostly, so... Uh, here's the Dimensional Barriers as my last two cards uh, for the Trap Trick uh, synergy here. So basically four copies total. Well, I hope you're excited to join me on this journey as I take upon the local challenge over the next couple of weeks. I'll be attending regularly, vlogging my experience, slightly, uh, shall we say, improving on our deck choice in the future, and of course our gameplay week by week and uh, hopefully will be an entertaining watch for you. Remember the best way to support this series is not cheap to make, it's the Patreon. If you like this and you've enjoyed watching this video, then it would be a really 
massive help if you could head over to Patreon and contribute a small poquito amount per month. Or if you have a free Twitch Prime, you can head over to my Twitch channel. What decks and archetypes are you interested in watching? Well, leave a comment down below. Tell me what you'd love to see next. And uh, I guess I'll see you in the next episode. Peace.